four. Organization. <laughs> Do you have a gardening problem? We can help you with that. A program dedicated to help you grow a better garden, maintain your landscape, grow healthier trees, make that grass look a little bit greener, as well as preserving what you grow. We're here to help you with your gardening problem. You're tuned in to Garden Talk Radio. You're listening to the most informational-packed hour of garden-focused radio in the country and on the Internet with your host, husband and wife team, Joey and Holly Baird. This is the Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener Radio Show. Welcome to the Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener Radio Show. The Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener Radio Show is presented to you by Power Planter Earth Augers, the official digging tool. To find the right size for your digging projects, visit powerplanter.com. Thank you for taking time out of your day to join us on the program. Whether you're listening to us through one of the 16 stations that are broadcasting our program here in 2020, through a radio app, the simple radio app, tune in app, uh, through our website. That website is the Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener.com underneath the season four tab at the top of the page. Uh, and podcast replay or in studio video replay. We thank you for taking time out of your day to be with us. I am your host, Joy Baird. Beside me is my wife, co-host, best friend, and gardening partner. Holly Baird. You can get a hold of us a couple of different ways. Uh, one being you can email us at any time at gardentalkradio at gmail.com. That's gardentalkradio at gmail.com. If you'd like to talk to us uh, during the show or after the show, you can certainly give us a call. Our hotline's open 24-7. You can give us a call at 1-800-927-SHOW. That's one 800 927 S H O W. And if we can't get to during the show, leave a message and we will call you back. Uh, we will. We'll call you back with the answer to your question that you have. We've got a big show lined up for you. What did you expect? Anything less? In segment one, we're going to talk about not all weeds are bad weeds in your garden. You may have a lot of weeds growing uh, right now, so uh, you might want to pay attention on that. Second uh, segment is pressure canning the correct way, as well as author. Sandra Smith will be with us and your garden questions. So let's get in the program, Holly. Uh, let's talk about not all weeds are bad weeds. Now, when it comes to weeds, we converted our traditional ground garden. You've heard that several times in the program if you are a regular listener, uh, to raise beds because we were tired of weeding. Now, not all weeds in the garden that we were fighting was necessarily detrimental, bad, invasive. However, uh, the reduction of weeding in a raised bed is uh, quite uh, rewarding. Right, definitely. And weeds can have a purpose. Um, they can att- they can attract many beneficial insects. They will often detour um, not so good sex, uh, insects away from other plants. Well, isn't a weed just a plant not growing in the right place? Isn't that kind of the definition? Sure. Yeah. Sure. Um, and then they will add organic matter to your soil. They also, the roots a lot of times will happen to aerate your soil, and sometimes they act as a ground cover. So there are some benefits to weeds um, in that sense. However, there are benefits to to certain weeds as well. Yeah, and weeds typically, uh, if you get a lot of them and they're a specific variety, they can choke out the plants in which you're trying to grow. Right. So the first weed we have here is dandelions. Most of us are familiar with dandelions well some people some of you try to kill dandelions some of you try to kill dandelions and you know who you are (laughs) um you don't necessarily want to do that they are the first food for bees in the spring well here's the other thing if you're in your yard spring the dandelions in the spring dandelions in the neighboring yard he or she or they don't care They're going to come over and seed in your yard. Dandelion seeds can float for many, many great distances and seed, and that you're really kind of wasting your time if you really look at it. Now, if you look at the health benefits and health health properties, now, the disclaimer, we are not doctors or plantologists or anything like that. So what we say, do not take it as, oh, they said it, so I'm going to do it. You need to do your research. That's our disclaimer. Right. So, and dandelions do have many health benefits or could have many health benefits. However, make sure that if you are going to 
eat dandelions or try to use them medicinally, that you are aware that we are not doctors or nutritionists or anything like that. So just um, be cautious. There are 300 different varieties of dandelions in the world. Uh, there are all parts of the dandelion can be used in some form or fashion for consumption or body health based on the uh, studies and the doctors in which you speak to. And from what our research shows, there's no copycat dandelions, meaning there's not a plant that's very similar to a dandelion that would be misinterpreted and that misinterpretation could lead to a very uh, severe um, in, uh, sickness, I guess. Uh, there's no plants that are similar to dandelions, but that's just some fun facts there. Right. Uh, and, and So there's many health benefits, as we had mentioned. Um, they are an excellent source of vitamin A, C, and K. Um, and then they also in, include... Um, vitamin E, folate, and then some small amounts of B vitamins. Well, and then here's the thing. It, let's just take the dandelions in the aspect of being in your vegetable garden. They're there for what? 35, 45 days at the most, kind of in the early spring. They don't regenerate right. in the summer. They, I have seen them occasionally in the fall sprout up, but it's like a real quick one and, you know, done that thing. They put the little flowers on and the seeds and then that's it until next year. Yeah. So that's definitely something to keep in mind that if you are going to use dandelions or harvest them that um, or just try to eradicate them, maybe you don't like them, um, they're only there in the spring, as now, Joy had mentioned. Now, some, home, uh, some homesteaders or people with rabbits will actually harvest. I mean, you can make dandelion wine and dandelion tea and all this other stuff, but they will simply go in and harvest the flower, the yellow flower of it, dehydrate it, and then bag it up, and that's a treat for the rabbits during the winter. So that's something... Uh, if you have pet rabbits, that uh, that's something you can do. Next one is lamb quarters or goose foot. Uh, it's very popular in the Native American culture years back. Um, it some people also call this wild spinach, right? So it is it is a very um, prevalent green that will grow in your yard or wherever, and it, you do want to make sure that it, you do identify. It, but it is it has a square stem. Yes. And, right. and it's very, if you're going to eat it and you've properly identified it, early on in the growth cycle is when you want it. As they get larger, they're not, they're, they get very tough and not very appealing. Now they, just like dandelions, lamb quarters, goose foot has a very distinct taste. When you say, uh, spinach substitute, it's not, doesn't taste like spinach, but it is, can be utilized. Whatever you did with spinach, you could utilize for lamb's quarters. Right. <clears throat> I would suggest go Swiss chard before go lamb's quarters, uh, because the Swiss chard is a little more palatable than the lamb's quarter is, especially later on in the growth cycle. Yeah. So, and it does have, again, a lot of vitamins and minerals. It has a lot of green because of the green. It's, uh, it's a green. So it has a lot of, um, beneficial properties in that sense if you choose to eat it. Um, so with the analines controlling them, that's up to you. Lamb's quarter, it's um, something that you just pull out. You just weed. Yeah, weed yeah you, we used to have it <clears throat> quite a bit in the uh, large garden, and we eradicated it. It was very easy. It wasn't like an invasive species. However, the next one on our list can be an invasive species. Yeah, so garlic mustard, which sounds kind of funny if you don't know what garlic mustard is it's a leafy they didn't green. have a baby mustard and garlic didn't have a baby that's not what this is no i remember my first encounter with garlic mustard i worked for um the city where by where i grew up and i worked for planting plants in flower beds and we had this i think she was a botanist i don't know whatever who came out with us and she was like this is garlic mustard and i'm like it's what and she's like, it's it's an invasive species. And then she started eating it. And I was like, what are you doing? And she told us, you know, it was edible. Um, so garlic mustard, yeah, It if you do, you want to harvest it while it's young. You want to eradicate it as fast as possible while it's young. So typically it's going to be like in our zone, it's usually around like May, end of May, early June, depending on where you are. But And we're in zone if, five. So if you're in zone four or three, it's a little later in the year if you're in zone Six or seven, a little earlier in the year. So kind of, right, kind yeah. of a reference there. So you just, even if you're not going to eat it or whatever, you just want to make sure that you get it pulled out. It's going to be easier to pull out. It's going to be easier to control the faster that you do that when you see it popping up. Now, flavor-wise. Flavor-wise, people love it for pesto. They use it in pesto, and it's a leafy green, so there's many benefits in that. 
um, something to keep in mind. All right. What's the next one on our list here? Um, broadleaf plantain. Okay. Plantain. Now, yeah. P-L-A-N-T-A-I-N. Yeah. Now some people think of plantains as the, the, the banana like, the banana like, yeah, yeah. uh, fruit, vegetable, whatever. This is that not is. it. No, this looks like, um, if you look it up, it's like a little leafy plant with like a little stalk shooting out the top. I don't really know how to describe it other than that. Um, so it, it, would you, it has like, um, you see it in your grass, you'll see it in your grass a lot. Right. But does it have like, you know, similar to like a tassel on a piece of corn? Yeah. Okay. But it's not, it doesn't have that big bulky, bulky uh, stem, but it has this little thing that pops up. Like a little up. tassel. That, okay. And some people buy the seeds and plant it on purpose. Right. Okay. So, <laughs> um, so yeah, this is, this is often seen in your yard, in your grass, whatever, because it's a broad, it's a broad leaf plant. Mm -hmm. Um, and this is something that people will eat as well. And like I said, people buy the seeds. Um, some people just have it, whatever. And it's something that you can, you can grow, you can leave, you can do whatever. It's, it's like, since it grows in your grass, if you are a perfect lawn obsessed individual, it might bother you, but most people don't necessarily even notice it. Well, another one is purslane. This is uh, a plant that has great beneficial uh, properties, uh, omega-3 fatty acids, if I uh, remember it correctly. Yeah, it has omega-3 fatty acids. Um, this comes, uh, this naturally occurs in a lot of places in North America. You, there are many seed companies in which per, you can purchase the seeds for, but we've got it coming up in our, in our grow bags, in the front yard, in the, in the it's, garden. It spreads fairly quickly and, and fast. To me, it looks like, um, almost like a ground cover seaweed slash, uh, ground cover succulent. It's very, it's very, it grows very flat. It has like thicker leaves. It has a nice reddish color stem. And yes, Joey, as Joey mentioned, it's, does have those omega-3 fatty acids. And if, when you do harvest it or when you do pl pluck it, you want to make sure you pluck it early before, um, because sometimes it will release seeds that mm -hmm. you don't see when you pull it out. So that's just, uh, some of the things that yes, they are, uh, in your garden, in your yard. You may not like them. However, there are beneficial properties to these uh, these weeds. Well, thank you for taking time out of your day to listen to our radio show. This is our 24th show of 2020. Did you miss last week's show, The Importance of Bats on Your Property? Over re repeated um, unaccurate garden information and author Rose Hayden-Smith. You can listen to that show by going to your favorite search engine, or your favorite podcast platform, and, and searching. They can go to their search engine and type in. Right. Yeah. Searching the Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener podcast, or we will make it even easier to find them. Send us an email to gardentalkradio at gmail.com, and in the subject line, put show 22, and we will send you, or sorry, show 23, and we will send you We'll send link. you 22 as well. It doesn't make a difference. <laughs> 22, 23. We'll send you all of them. Yeah. We'll be right back. Do not go anywhere. We'll be talking about pressure canning. You're listening to the Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener radio show. A program to help you grow a better garden, maintain your landscape, help your trees grow better, make that grass look greener, and preserving what you grow for indoor and out. Got a question for Joey and Holly? Send it via email anytime to gardentalkradio at gmail.com. We here at the Wisconsin Vegetable Gardens understand that healthy soil is always the key to a successful garden. We know that chemical fertilizer burns carbon out of the soil and kills the micro life needed for a healthy soil ecosystem. No worries. Chicken Soup for the Soil by Dr. Jim's will stimulate life in the soil and supply all the nutrients that most fertilizers neglect. Rather than force-feeding water-soluble chemical fertilizer, we suggest feeding the microbes a smorgasbord of 100% bioavailable nutrients that your plants can consume when they need them. Chicken Soup for the Soil is an amazing fertilizer that will increase the quality of all the fruits and vegetables you grow. Perfect for gardeners, growers, and farmers. To find out more about Chicken Soup for the Soil and other products, visit drjims.com. That's D-R-J-I-M-Z dot C-O-M. The new way to support your tomatoes, wrap it and snap it. Tomatosnaps.com. Do not go anywhere. There is more of the Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener radio show to come, which is presented to you by Power Planter Earth Augers, the official digging tool. To find the right size for your digging project, visit powerplanter.com. Pomona's Universal Pectin is a high-quality pectin that gels reliably with low amounts of any sweetener. If you're trying to reduce the amount of sugar in your diet, you'll love Pomona's Universal Pectin. 
Now you can make healthy homemade jams and jellies sweetened to your taste. You can use sugar or honey to sweeten. Bobono's Universal Pectin keeps indefinitely when stored in an airtight container. Easy to use, versatile, and comes with directions and recipes in every box. Find out more and where to buy at PomonaPectin.com. Also available at natural food stores and online. When it comes to bulk landscaping materials, Blue Mills Garden and Landscape Center is where everyone goes. Whatever the project, we have the materials you need with over 40 varieties to choose from. Soils, mulches, gravels, decorative stones, fresh cut sod. Blue Mills has these products in stock and ready for easy pickup or fast delivery. So what are you waiting for? Now is the time to get your yard back into shape. Stop in and pick these materials up or call us for delivery today. Nobody does bulk landscaping materials better than Blue Mills Garden and Landscape Center. Blue Mills, 4930 West Loomis Road, 414-282-4220. The Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener Radio Show is brought to you by the following. Power Planter Earth Augers, Ivy Organics, Root Maker, Pomona Universal Pectin, Chapin Manufacturing Incorporated, Pro Plugger, Tomato Snaps, World's Coolest Floating Rain Gauge. Find all sponsors at the Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener.com and thank them for their support. Now back to the Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener Radio Show, which is presented to you by Power Planter Earth Augers, the official digging tool. To find the right size for your digging project, visit PowerPlanter.com. Now here are your hosts, Joey and Holly Baird. Welcome back to the Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener Radio Show. We're going to talk about pressure canning. Do you pressure can? Do you water bath can? Do you preserve in that form or fashion? Well, there is a difference between water bath canning and pressure canning, and we're going to go over water bath canning. And we will say up front that if you're going to do one or the other, obviously if you're a new canner, you would want to focus on the water bath canning. That seems to be the best basis or understanding of the preserving process through canning in a jar. And then once you understand that science, then you can step up to the pressure canning procedure. Correct. Correct. So pressure canning is for low or no acid foods, whether that be vegetables, meat, um, beans, legumes, anything in that category. Now, pressure canning does not include things like grains. That doesn't, that doesn't count. So, um, again, it has to be like a bean, a legume, vegetable, or meat. Uh, before you pressure can anything, there's a couple of things you want to do. You want to find a resource that's reputable, that can be trusted. Just don't go off of a YouTube video that Aunt Paula made from Seattle, Washington. It says you can do this. Right. You want to use a reputable source. So that includes sites like the National Center for Home Food Preservation, Ball Canning, Better Homes and Gardens. Um, yeah, those are three really great resources. And that's definitely something that you want to use. Now, you want to know the pressure for your altitude. And this is something that you can learn from the National Center for Home Food Preservation or even your local university extension. You should know where you're at on you that. You should know where, where you're your at. altitude is at. Yeah, right. that's easy to figure out if you've, you know, got an internet. Uh, but maybe some people move or right. whatever. You're but, new to but this is very important to the proper canning procedure when it comes to pressure canning. Not so much, well, to a certain degree, water bath canning as well. Right. Because the, the pressure that, the, all that that goes on. So mm-hmm. you need to know it for both. Right, for sure, for sure. And because a lot of the times these books will say do 15 PSI, blah, 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 and you might have to adjust that based on where you are. And, and it, it can be quite a bit of difference. I know when uh, I was canning peaches, uh, raw packed peaches the other day, water bath, it was 30 minutes for our altitude. But if we were over 6,000 feet or something, it was an extra 15 minutes in the water bath canner. Yeah. So that's something to... So definitely keep in mind. Now, your pressure canner is going to have seals, gaskets, what have you, and you want to make sure that those are checked often. So a lot of times you have to, you might have to call around. Sometimes university extensions will check it. Sometimes um, certain uh, hardware, hardware stores. So it's something that you definitely want to to keep in mind. Um, so that is another one. Now, when you're ready to can or you're going to can your items, you want to peel your vegetables. And that's, that is because there are some good things in your soil. It's not an option. It's not an option. No, there's some good things in your soil and there's some bad things in your soil. 
And with the bad things, that includes like botulism. So when you're, when you have potatoes, carrots, um, radishes. Well, beets and radishes, beets you can, radishes. you can pickle both of those, but, uh, if you was going to preserve, you can, yeah, people you do can, them. yeah. Um, beets, radishes, what have you. Pars- um, parsnips, root, parsnips, parsnips rutabaga. rutabaga, yep. So you want to make sure you peel those items. And the same thing goes for like pumpkin or squash. Uh, and, and when you bring up pumpkin and squash with any of these things, uh, in, in the pressure canning realm, you can't have it mashed. It has to be cubed. If you're going to do something like applesauce or pear sauce, that's different, and it can be in, in the end result, or the end form when you put it in the jar, like the, the puree. Right. So you want, yeah, you want to make sure that if it's something like pumpkin, like we can pumpkin for when we make pumpkin, pumpkin pie with it, but we cube it. So we peel it and we cube it. Same thing with potatoes or anything. You can't just can like mash potatoes or mashed pumpkin or mashed squash or mashed spaghetti squash or whatever. You want to make sure that you are cubing it. I don't think you want to can spaghetti no, squash. No, but but with the reason behind yeah. this being that it doesn't it, it doesn't properly get to the correct temperature internally if it's in the mashed form. It's inconsistent temperature ranges inside of that food and it can't cannot safely be uh, cooked and sealed in that jar if it's not in the cube form. Right. So, um, yeah, you want to be wise about what you are canning. So you want to can the most purest or whole food item. So that means like if you want to use beans, you want to use, the if, you, if you're canning a meat chili, use the ground meat. And then when it comes to your spices, you don't want to use like a prepackaged chili mix. You want to use like chili powder and the raw raw very raw, yeah. raw basic ingredient cumin garlic whatever but not like a, a spice packet because there's emulsifiers and additives in those spice packets and that could cause problems uh yes uh always the rawest ingredient and then that way you you really know exactly what is in that that canned item because you went to the rawest basic ingredient you grew the, the item and then you use the basic, you know, chili powder or whatever, the, the raw, pure stuff, so it's not adding any uh, additional salt that's not required. And also, you know, you can can it safely because with those uh, emulsifiers, it can cause chemical reactions and everything else inside that jar. Um, and when these recipes are performed or uh, decided that they are safe from ball canning, from the National Home for Food Preservation, they... Do this so you don't die. They've done the, you know, there's a lot of studies and a lot of tests done to make sure that when they publish a recipe on how to can pumpkin, that it's done and done correctly so it all ends happily ever after. Right. And then you want to use, um, you want to use what's fresh. So if you have some mushy, mushy, questionable carrots, you don't want to can those. You're going to be canning, you're going to be preserving. Bad, bad food, yeah. basically, right? Like, even meat. You're like, I, I have this meat. I don't know. It's kind of old. It's been in my freezer. Maybe I should can it. Like, no, canning no, it no. doesn't make it fresh again. <laughs> no, you're not. It's not magic. So that's definitely something you want to consider. Um, you don't want to use a pressure cooker. So there's like um, Instapot or Instapot varieties, knockoffs, whatever you want to call them. Those electrical pressure cookers. They are very convenient for cooking. They are not for canning, and that's because you can't calibrate them to make sure they're getting to the proper pressure to can safely. Now, didn't or wasn't Ball going to come out with a an a, a electrical device that was in, for the intention of pressure canning? I think so. <clears throat> I, I don't know if it's made the market or not, but your standard pressure cooker or Instapot, no go. Right. Um, it'll yeah. make you feel good at the beginning, but it'll make you sick at the end, right. if not kill you, because you're not doing it correctly. Right. Um, and then think about what you want to can before you invest. So maybe you're like, oh, I just want to can like some carrots or whatever, or some green beans, but I don't have a lot to can. You might be better off freezing them. Now, when you say green beans, so there's some people listening that their whole lives, it's been water bath canned green beans. I grew up with water bath canned green beans. Right. But that has changed. Right. So green beans, now you have to pressure can. You cannot water bath can them safely. Something about the acid changing the food and the soil, blah, blah, blah. So, you and, want- and that's why recipes are not 
um, the same as they were in 1947, 52, 63, right. because the properties and the food that were growing is very different than it was back then. Correct. So, yeah. So you want to, you need to decide, like, you know, it is good to invest in a pressure canner, but if you're not going to can a whole lot, or you just don't, some people buy these like 15 jar canners. And if that's not what you're canning or what you're doing, then maybe like we have a, we have a small pressure canner. It holds four quarts. We could definitely probably use something bigger, but some people like that four quart right. canner. Right. Uh, yeah. If you're, if you're only going to do eight quarts of potatoes or eight quarts of pumpkin, it makes no financial sense to invest in an $800 multi, uh, canner, pressure canner unit. When you're not going to utilize that. If you're just going to do a few and you don't want to invest, you know, you can just buy it at the store or that type of thing or, or get somebody to do it for you and kind of, you know, help them out. That's always a benefit. Now, when, when we talk about cubing, the, let's go back to that a minute. When we talk about cubing the vegetables and putting in the jar, people are like, well, I go to the store and it's in a puree form in the can. What's the difference? Those are industrial canners and they have the proper equipment to make sure that it's getting to the, the hot temperature. They're getting to a hot point where it kills. There's not much of anything left in that right. thing. Right, yeah. and you cannot achieve that in your home unless maybe you some sort of do some. Sort you just of can't do it. Rigging. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I don't even. I can't even imagine. But no, you cannot. Yeah. You yeah. can't. And some red, some red green rigging. <laughs> <laughs> you cannot safely can mush carrots or whatever potato mashed potatoes whatever um, in your in your home. Right. So if if you're going to you know look at obviously pressure canning, different instructions, different procedure uh, with this and, and everything in between, um, what where is the you know you go where is a good place to to look at canners? I guess you just go online or is there a specific type of well couldn't you get a hold of the your local extension office and if you have a master canner in your area you could get the referral from them what they would recommend yeah they they could definitely recommend something otherwise you would just google you know can, canner uh pressure canner what have you and then you could base it off of that there's a lot of different brands out there right but pressure canner not pressure cooker right pressure canner that's correct um i don't we got ours for our wedding i don't right. know where it came from i don't remember but um but when you, yeah. for people who are not familiar with the pressure canning world, water bath, pretty universal in the basic operation of the unit of the water bath canner. When it comes to pressure canning, you have to specifically follow the instructions of that particular manner. It's not one size fits all when it comes to a pressure canner versus a water bath canner. That's correct, yes. It is not one size fits all. You need to follow those, the manufacturer's instructions. And when we give our canning talk, we always do say that, that it is a manufacturer's instructions because there's weighted canners, there's weighted gauge canners, and there's dial gauge canners, and those are not the same. Lock lids and bolt, bolted lids and, and, uh, the, uh, on, on the closing note here, canners now, if you're gonna go, you really wanna, if you're gonna be serious about this, you wanna go and invest in a brand new canner. Buying one at the, Goodwill store or at a flea market or at a yard sale, probably not the safest way to go. Now, there is like the Facebook marketplace and right. Craigslist, and a lot of times you'll you'll run across some decent canners that way. Okay. But you do want, you know, you want to ask questions. If somebody's selling a canner, why? Where is it coming from? How long have you had it? Blah, blah, blah. Well, if it's like, from 1973, the safety it's thing. It's probably olive green. The safety uh things on it is very different if there's any safety uh, valves or pressure releases in on it at all uh, from back then ours has two safety valves and if there is a, even a fraction of a percent of a pound in that canner it will not let you open that lid until it's completely dead zero pounds in there so you that's, yeah, yeah that's a very good point is that we have uh safety has changed safety measures what have you and yes, um, that's why it, it's, it's still dangerous. If, right. if not done correctly, it can still put a hole in the roof if not done correctly. So it's just like anything in life. You want to follow directions. Well, uh, just like anything in life, it's summer. It's hot. Japanese beetles are here. I saw them outside on the pole beans the other day. So what do we need to do with them? 
uh, especially with the Japanese beetles. But if you got weevils and boars, uh, you need to take care of those as well. And what better way to prevent these pests from destroying your garden or your lawn or a raspberry bush or whatever than to control anything them? Anything they see. Anything they see than to control them as soon as possible. And you can do that with Grub Gone, which is an easy to apply granular product that can be spread on your turf to successfully control grub invaders. This is developed by phylum bioproducts from a naturally occurring bacteria. Grub Gone is a non-chemical BT product that specifically targets only certain scarab pests. And it is safe to use around bees and other beneficial insects. You got the beetles flying around your yard. Get Beetle Gone. It's the only organic water disposable powder that you can spray directly, yep, right on your edible plants with zero days to harvest. Find out more at phylumbioproducts.com. That's P-H-Y-L-L-O-M bioproducts.com to find a location near you and more information about how beneficial it can be for your property. Do not go anywhere. When we come back, author Sandra Smith will be with us. You're listening to the Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener. Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener's phone lines are always jammed during the show. So Joey and Holly keep their phone lines open 24-7 to help you. Call anytime, 24-7. Just dial 1-800-927-7469. Or just remember, 1-800-927-SHOW. S-H-O-W. Leave a message and they will call you back. Planting conditions are always favorable with the Power Planter Earth Auger. No matter what the job is, Power Planter has the right size for you. Simply attach to a drill and let the Power Planter do the work for you, creating holes fast and efficiently with ease. Find the size that fits your project at PowerPlanter.com. Brought to you by Blue Ribbon Organics, providing locally made organic compost and soil blends for gardens, farms, landscaping, and more. Visit BlueRibbonOrganics.com or call 262-497-8539 to find their products nearest you. For all your indoor growing needs, equipment, and supplies, it's WeGrowIndoors.com. Do not go anywhere. There is more of the Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener radio show to come which is presented to you by Power Planter Earth Augers, the official digging tool. To find the right size for your digging project, visit powerplanter.com. The number one key to healthy, productive plants are the roots. Starting from seed to full-grown plants, rootmaker.com has the answer. From seed-starting trays with an innovative design that air prunes the roots, creating a fabulous root system, never again will you have root-bound plants. To multiple gallon grow bag sizes to raise beds. Rootmaker.com has your grow needs covered. Visit Rootmaker.com. Use coupon code TWVG at checkout and get 10% off your entire order. The Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener Radio Show is brought to you by the following. Phylum Bioproducts, Dr. Jim's, Nasala Kabucha, MI Greenhouse LLC, Green Gobbler, Water Hoop, Seed Savers Exchange. Find all sponsors at the WisconsinVegetableGardener.com and thank them for their support. It's the middle portions of summer and your projects may not be completely done and you need more material. Well, Blue Mel's Landscape and Garden Center has those items for you. 40 varieties of bulk material, largest in the area. You can find them at 4930 West Loomis Road, just off of Layton and Greenfield. You can give them a call at 414-282-4220. You can visit them online at bluemails.com to see all that they have available. You can pick it up, or they can deliver it right to your property, right to your job site. So get your jobs done so you can enjoy the rest of your summer. Blue Mails Landscape and Garden Center, bluemails.com. Now back to the Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener Radio Show, which is presented to you by Power Planter Earth Augers, the official digging tool. To find the right size for your digging project, visit powerplanter.com. Now here are your hosts, Joey and Holly Baird. Welcome back to the Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener Radio Show. Holly, let's go to the hotline and bring in our guest for this week. Sandra Smith is the author of the award-winning middle grade slash young adult series called The Seed Savers. She has a garden of her own. She keeps chickens, and she lives with her family in the Pacific Northwest. Welcome to the program. 
Sandra? Thank you. I'm glad to be here. Well, thank you for uh, taking time out of your day to join not only Holly and myself, but all of our listeners across the country. And you're, you're a very unique guest that we've, uh, we're having on today. You're, we've never had and never interviewed a fiction writer. So where does the passion of writing come from for you? Many people we have on talk about growing tomatoes or vegetables, but you're a little different in this realm. Well, first of all, I'm, I'm honored to be your first fiction author. And even though Seed Savers series is fiction, there's a lot of um, facts and truth woven into the story. Um, my passion for writing is just I've, I've always been a writer, I think, because I'm an introvert. Maybe I, uh, it's easier for me to communicate through writing. So I'm, I'm not sure if that's what, uh, you were asking, but that's, you know, you can clarify if you wanted something different from no, that. We all have our own, uh, uh, desires and our own drive and, and that's yours. Yeah. I understand. I am, I am too an introvert and do enjoy <laughs> writing myself and I get it. It's, uh, it's a way to kind of get your, thought so in a way you can express yourself without like standing up in front of people <laughs> <laughs> exactly exactly so your book series why don't you tell us about your book series um what it's about and then also where your inspiration for that book series came from yeah so basically um the seed saver series is uh, it's five books and the gist of it it's it's set in a future where home gardening has been outlawed for years and fresh food is uh, pretty much unknown and unavailable because it's ultra-processed and controlled by a kind of corporate-owned government. And so in the story, the kids are kind of the heroes, and they're the younger generation, and they don't know what food is. And then they're, like, on this journey learning about it from an older mentor. And I was first inspired by watching the documentary um, Food, Inc., in that in that documentary, there's a lot to do with the meat, but there's a point where there's um, this guy named Mo Parr who is a seed cleaner who cleans the seeds for farmers. And in the documentary, they start to say, like, you know, there were used to be this many seed cleaners, and now there's this few. And I was just thinking, uh, I've never even heard of that occupation. And then my next thought was, well, what have you never heard of a seed? And then that's kind of how the story starts where these kids are given a seed or they hear about seeds first and they're like what's a seed they didn't even know like the word seed so that was the basic inspiration for the story well you, you say that it's, it's set in the future whenever you describe that some of our listeners as well as i are thinking that may not be so out of the realm of possibilities in the very near future the way some people believe that the government and other important are so to personal labeled important agencies are trying to uh, dictate how certain things are done in this country right and uh, I used to think um, you know maybe the extreme of it in my book was kind of far-fetched but then there are uh, certain you know laws and then I mean for that part of the, the story and then there's also this idea that uh, there's just a lot of kids that, you know, don't know, like, that a carrot grows underground, for instance. Right. Because all their food is from bags. Right. They just think it's at, where do you get vegetables? Grocery store? They have no, right. they, they're, there's such a disconnect there that yes. we, we've lost a lot there uh, in, in just a few generations. Yes, yes. And so this is taking it forward. I don't think I mentioned, like, the year in the first book, but it ends up being, like, 2077. And so I use, uh, up until, like, now, I, I actually use really real events and laws and stuff. And then after now, I you know, I got to make the rest of that up. So. Oh, okay. That's, that's neat. Now, yeah. you like to motivate social change for young, young adults um, through your stories. Why is that important? And I think we kind of touched on that with, like, you know, how things are changing rapidly, it seems like, almost every day. But why is that important when you started the series? Yeah, and I and it was kind of interesting when I read that. I, um, people have asked me that. And um, I don't think when I, um, origin, when I wrote the first one that I was 
intending to motivate social change. Uh, it was more of a, a love story for food. <laughs> but I do think it is important for um, children to realize that they can help change the future because, after all, the future belongs to them. And so I want it to be an empowering story for kids. Um, but I think originally... Um, I, you know, I grew up on a, a berry farm, and my mom had a huge garden, and we didn't we didn't buy very many things at all. We canned and we froze, and you know, we grew our own beef, milked the cow, that sort of thing. And so, for me, I just really love food and growing food and cooking food and eating food, and so there's really a lot of that <laughs> in the first couple of books. And then it gets more political because. It kind of it kind of had to because of the situation that caused, you know, the whole conflict right. being, you know, controlled. So, yeah. Yep. And just for people are tuning in, we're listening. To, we're speaking with Sandra Smith, author of the award-winning middle grade young adult series Seed Savers. So, how did you go from farm life to city life? Uh, where? How did that happen? Uh, well, it's just. One of those things that happens in life, I didn't mean to end up in the city. I, um, you know, I went away to college and then, then I went to China for three years and taught English and then I came back and, um, I lived where it was available for me to live. And so, you know, someday maybe I'll get back out there, but it wasn't necessarily, uh, a choice. I'm going to leave the country and go live in the city. How how has how did growing up on a on in the country on the farm how has that benefited you by whenever you moved to the city obviously you probably took some of those skills and was able to incorporate <laughs> some of into your daily life yeah I kind of try to recreate on my little lot and a half <laughs> as much as I can and so you know I've planted all along the yard I've got a a garden and and I've got my four chickens and there's the pear tree and so. I still um, I still grow as much as I can, and then I, my mom and dad still have have the big garden, and I grow things out there as well. Do you, so, and I I still can, you know. I'm I'm gonna go pick my hundred pounds of peaches tomorrow, and and can those all up. So <laughs> I guess having grown up there, um, I don't have this fear of you know pressure cookers and all kinds of things that I hear about. Definitely not. Now, does your does your spouse remind you to lock the doors? Like I have to remind Joey sometimes, who grew up on a farm, to lock the doors because I'm I'm the I'm the city girl here. So no, because because we um, at my house out there, we always we always locked the door. I know some people in some places didn't, but we always did. So <laughs> now, not a problem. Yeah, um, you are a member of your local seed bank. What so what is a seed bank, and why would somebody want to join one? Okay, and and I do need to update that because sadly um, my seed bank no longer meets, but it was located at our um, our local food share, and what we would do would be to um, we would decide which seeds we were going to grow out, and then we would divide it up, and we would grow uh, maybe a certain kind of tomato or or bean or whatever heirloom seeds that would come true. And then we would save those seeds, and we were trying to get up um, a bulk to, you know, share with the community. Also, um, uh, you know, I could talk too long on this. There's just a lot of advantages to a seed bank because the seeds that you would grow and save and grow and save would be adapted locally to where you are. And so those seeds would always produce well for that. Uh, seed banks can also just be really educational for somebody who doesn't know anything about it. You know, how to, how to save the seed and what's the process, what kinds of seeds can be saved. Um, and then, you know, basic of, uh, preserving genetic diversity. So there's a lot of different things and probably everybody's seed bank would maybe be focused on something. Now, does a, a seed, when you, when you've, created this seed bank was it a public thing or can it be a private thing can it be a neighborhood thing just a few houses there's really no set rule in order to create one is there no i don't think so this was just like i said we have uh what's called the uh, the food share that's what it's called and it's 
has, you know, food for people in need. And so within that food share, um, somebody decided to, to start this. And I don't even remember how I found out. Probably I found out about it through Master Gardeners. I'm not sure. And so it can be anybody in the community and, yeah, start it up and get interested people involved. And I guess whenever you, just like in the backyard, if you're going to save your own seeds, you've got to make sure that certain for certain like varieties don't cross or, or you only grow right. one of those type of varieties. Yeah, that was one of the things that, you know, we had classes about. And so, you know, if I was growing this tomato for the seed share, I would usually put it like in a pot on the opposite side of the house or, you know, you could cover it up with a sheet. There were um, there was instruction on that so that we wouldn't cross-pollinate. Oh, that's very interesting. Yep. Um, so how can we find out more about you and where can we find your books? Um, well, um, I have a website that answers to either authorsmith.com or seedsaversseries.com. They'll both get to my website. And there you can find out about me and the books and all my other social media sites. What, and my what, blog is there as well. What age would you recommend, uh, being the youngest for, for parents to go ahead and get the book for their kids if they're, what, what kind of age range would you, would you say for your books? Well, um, at, starting at the beginning, cause the first two books are younger, mm -hmm. we say 10 and up, but I know there's kids as young as seven who have read or have them read too. So, pretty uh, young on that. Great series. they get a little older. Great series of books for the young gardener or if you've got kids or grandkids or nieces or nephews that kind of help you in the garden or kind of question what you're doing, this would be a great series for them to uh, see what could potentially happen if uh, we don't keep things in check in our generation. Well said. Well, we greatly appreciate the time you've offered us, uh, Sandra, and... Uh, we uh, look forward to talking with you again. Thank you so much for taking time and sharing your information, not only with Holly and myself, but all of our listeners. Yes, thank you. Absolutely. And when we come back, it's all about your garden questions, our garden answers, and uh, we'll see what we can do on that. You're listening to the Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener Radio Show a Program to help your garden grow better. Got a question for Joey and Holly? Send it via email anytime to gardentalkradio at gmail.com. Trimbin turns any chair into a workstation. Comfortably sort your herbs, dried flowers, cannabis, and more. Easily collect pollen with a static brush and mirror finished collection tray. High walls keep your work contained. To get yours, visit harvest-more.com. Made in California. Do not go anywhere. There is more of the Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener radio show to come, which is presented to you by Power Planter Earth Augers, the official digging tool. To find the right size for your digging project, visit powerplanter.com. World's coolest rain gauge dot com. Need I say more? Protect your plants against damage with a 3 in 1 plant guard and special blend fertilizer. Visit ivyorganics.com. Blue Mel's Garden and Landscape Center offers an awesome selection of high quality garden and landscape products. We have just the plants you're looking for annuals, perennials, veggies, herbs, and more. Plus, you can always count on us to answer all of your questions and offer expert advice. Blue Mel's also carries the largest selection of bulk landscape materials in the area. Enjoy a beverage from our coffee shop while your kids run around in our huge playground. Join our growing list of highly satisfied customers. Visit the garden center that offers everything you're looking for. Visit Blue Mel's today. Blue Mel's 4930 West Loomis Road, 414-282-4220. The Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener Radio Show is brought to you by the following. Neptune Harvest, Happy Leaf LED, Dripworks, We Grow Indoors, Deer Defeat, Harvest More, Blue Ribbon Organics, Blue Mills Landscape and Garden Center, Chip Drop. Find all sponsors at the WisconsinVegetableGardener.com and thank them for their support. Now back to the Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener Radio Show, which is presented to you by Power Planter Earth Augers, the official digging tool. To find the right size for your digging project, visit powerplanter.com. Now here are your hosts, Joey and Holly Baird. Welcome back to the Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener Radio Show. 
question and answer time. We're going to get to some of your questions. If you've got a question, you can submit it two different ways. That'd be the easiest. You can give us a call at 1-800-927-SHOW, 1-800-927-SHOW, or you can drop us a line. You can call us anytime, 24-7, whether right now while we're on the air or, uh, you know, 3 o'clock on a Saturday morning. It doesn't matter. Uh, you can get the uh, question submitted to us, and we'll get back to you. Uh, if you want to send us an email, you can do that uh, by emailing gardentalkradio at gmail.com, gardentalkradio at gmail.com. You will get connected to us. Well, uh, we had a couple of calls come in this week. Let's go to Bob. He listens to the Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener radio show on WOGO 680 AM and FM 103.1 out of Chippewa Falls, Wisconsin. So what? Uh, let's see what Bob has to, uh, what, what he's looking for. Yeah, yeah. I just wanted to ask about a tomato problem or tomato situation. My tomato plants are starting to kind of wilt on the bottom. They're real tall and everything, and they already have. These are cherry tomato plants, by the way. And uh, I just wondered if that's normal because I've I've grown tomatoes, you know, the same kind of plants, you know, in years past, and I never noticed that. But my memory isn't perfect, so. But anyway, uh, you know, uh, could, maybe you could tell me what if that's bad or good or, you know. Don't worry about it or whatever. Thank you. All right. Can we help Bob out with his tomato question? Yeah, Bob. So that is called early blight, and that is yellow. Even even though it's midway through the season, it's right, still it's early still, blight. Yep, that's still because there's good and bad things in your soil always, and early blight is one of them. So what you're going to do is you're going to trim off the bottom portion of your tomato plants. I no, think no, that portion might, being about six inches. Yeah. Okay. okay. <laughs> The bottom half. No, don't. No, that's no, too no. much. Six to eight inches, or or up to twenty five percent of the foliage, full coverage of the plant. Yeah. Right. Um, so this will help prevent a lot of the splashing. Another thing is, is you can take whole grain cornmeal. At the, so next year you can do it at the beginning of the season, and then also about halfway through the season, just sprinkle around the base of each plant, and then also mulch is is good as well. Yeah, always try to mulch around the base of your tomato plants. Mulch around any of your plants. It does a couple of things. We talked about this on the program uh, last week or the week before. Mulch suppresses weeds, holds moisture, and, and during the hottest portion of the summer, it can reduce the soil temperature from 3 to 5 degrees. Now, you may not think that's very much, but a lot of these plants are very sensitive when it comes to the heat in the soil. So if you can keep them moistened and the mulch on top of them, you can actually reduce that soil temperature by 10 or 15 degrees. Uh, it, it's a tremendous uh, benefit to utilize mulch. And mulch can be anything from chemical-free seed grass clippings uh, uh, to straw to shredded leaves. We pile a lot of leaves up each year in the garden uh, when fall time comes and utilize it in the early portion of the spring. Pine needles work very well as a mulch as well because it doesn't break down and it doesn't make your soil acidic. Uh, as many people may think, that simply is not the case when it comes to uh, the mulch. Uh, with in, mulching with pine needles. And you can use shredded paper. That'll break down very quickly um, over time. And there are biodegradable uh, weed fabrics or plastics uh, to a certain degree, if you want to call that biodegradable. That's what they're labeled. Uh, it takes many years uh, for it to break down, but it doesn't, you know, with the sun hitting and the UV rays and all that. So, yeah, uh, trim the bottom tomatoes. You utilize some mulch and uh, see uh, that definitely will, and the whole grain cornmeal will definitely uh, you'll see a tremendous difference in the success and the production of your tomato plants. Let's go to Minneapolis, where Leonard listens to the Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener radio show on KDIZ 1570 AM. And uh, he's got a question, I believe it's about cucumbers. The question is, my cucumbers are not producing fruit. Seems to be lots of blossoms and lots of bugs for bees around but not producing any fruit, and I just wondered what the problem might be. In the past, I've always had good luck with cucumbers. Thank you much. All right, can we help him with the cucumbers, Holly? We certainly can, Leonard. Um, so what's going on is a lot of times, or oh, yeah, every time, fine crops such as cucumbers and squash put out their male flowers and first, and then they look for stimulation. Are they going to get that stimulation that they need, and then... When they feel that that's proper, they're going to put out an equal or greater amount. a greater amount of female flowers. So when you see these plants flowering, 
you want to take your finger and just touch the tip of that flower. It's going to stimulate that plant. It's going to put up the female flowers. Then you're going to have a successful fruiting. Also, um, you know, we want to keep in mind that, that he's in the Minneapolis area, which is zone four, which is a little cooler. Uh, I don't know, you know, depending on the time of year, obviously, but, uh, that, that also is a very big factor in cucumber production is the ambient temperature. Cucumbers, uh, soil temperature wise, they don't like it any colder really than 65 degrees. That's why people will try to get a jump start on cucumbers early in the season. And they don't do any good. They don't. They they perform very poorly because that soil temperature is far too cold. And then later in the year, they try to grow another crop. They do good. And then the evening and the nighttime temperatures get cooler, and they don't like that either. So it can be a, a very variable factors of, you know, you want to touch the flower to stimulate uh, the plant to say that there's a lot of bees and pollinators out there. And also you want to make sure that you're in a very sunny spot uh, when it comes to uh, the the planting of the cucumber. All right, let's go to. Uh, I have a. I have four cabbage plants, and all. Let's see. I have four cabbage plants, which one has a head started on it. They are covered with a white mesh, and I heard that they should flower in order to form heads. I've never heard of this before with cabbages having flowers on them. Any idea why the other three have not started forming a head? And should I uncover the cabbage? Henry asked this. Well, uh, you do not, that, that is some more misinformed information about the cabbage has to flower before it puts a head on. That's simply not the case. Um, if you've got four and one is already beginning to head, uh, the other three will not be far behind. Uh, just give a little patience. Now, if of all of them, if there was none that was uh, forming heads, then I would say, okay, now we need to look at, is there something going on with the roots? Is there bugs? What the case is? But give it a little time. Uh, they will um, gather their their stuff together and put heads on the other three cabbages. Uh, excessive nitrogen could cause plants not to uh, head upright. Also, soggy roots, alkaline soil could also be a reason why heads are not forming. But with this instant, um, this instant, uh, he's got one out of four starting, and I think the other three will uh, be just uh, real close behind. Okay, so I have a question that came in from my friend Deanna. All righty. And she is new to canning, gardening. Um, the whole thing. The whole thing. And she asked, um, she had asked me, she wants to make pickles out of her pickling cucumbers. Okay, at least they're pickling cucumbers mm-hmm. because you don't want to do slicing cucumbers and making pickles out of them because then you got a jar of mush. That's what you end up with. Right. And then her, her friend has a brine recipe. Okay. And I had asked her, I said, do you want to do shelf-stable or refrigerator cucumbers? And she said shelf-stable. And she wanted to know if she could just make the brine, let it sit, then do the pickles, and and just... Make them hot and then seal them. Okay. Um, the easy answer, so, the simple answer is no, and we'll explain step by step here what, why here. So I provided her with a link to the National Center for Home Food Preservation. Again, it's the National Center for Home Food Pre- Preservation about safe pickling uh, practices, safe canning practices, safe um, water bath canning practices, and all the whole nine yards. Right. Um, and that way, so she has that information, but. Uh, first of all, when it comes to pickling, especially cucumbers, cucumbers tend to get mushy. So you want to do this quick and efficiently. And then also, um, yeah, it's, a, thing, it's a time thing. It's, it's a time not, thing. Oh, I'll do a little bit now, a little bit later. You got to do it all at once or don't do it at all. Right. So quick and efficiently. And then also that you need to use a recipe, like a trusted recipe, not just like your pals, grandmas. And I know some of you are just tired of hearing us talk about (laughs) early blight and reputable, (laughs) safe recipes when it comes to canning. But it's because we care about you. Right. Right. So, um, yeah, so I explained that to her, that you need to be safe, you need to do properly, you need to follow the directions, it needs to be a proper recipe. And I do use, I prefer to use, and I know Deanna, we, we grew up, and we went to the same high school. She's also a city girl and since this is her first time canning. Okay. I was like, you can use this pickling package mix that you can get at Fleet Farm right. or what, what hardware the, store. Yeah, yeah. Because so, there's some people who don't have no clue what that. Okay, it's Mrs. Wages. <laughs> okay, okay. So if you're like, if you're like, at, I don't know if I want home can pickles. At a farm I want, store, at a hardware store, yeah. they have these. The grocery store yeah, has grocery them as well. Store, yeah. yeah. 
if you're like, I've never pickled before, I don't know if I'm going to like home canned pickles, because that's how I feel. Like, Joey and I made home canned pickles from pickling spice, brine, whatever. I didn't care for them. I like this Mrs. Wages stuff. So if that's your jam, I that's what I recommend. It gives you all the directions on the on the package and everything. So, yeah. So that's that's what's up. Yep. Follow the instructions. Do it right and enjoy it. And I hope you've enjoyed the program today. We greatly appreciate you taking time to join us. We're out of time. And... We thank you for yours. Miss any portion of this program, or you can revisit it simply by going to our website. That's the WisconsinVegetableGardener.com, clicking on the Season 4 tab at the top of the page. Or we can make it easy for you. You can send us an email at GardenTalkRadio at gmail.com and ask for the link for this show, Episode 23. Uh, and we'll send you that link. Check out past shows on our website under the Season 4 tab, 3 tab, 2 and 1 tabs as we have a lot of content there, as well as over 1,700 garden videos. Tell your garden friends and your neighbors that this program is on the air. That's how our message gets heard. Join us next week on the program where we'll be talking about overwintering plants in your garden, what you want to bring in, what you can keep out, and everything in between, as well as our guest, seed expert, seed-saving expert, Ben Cohen, will be with us, and your garden questions. That's all next week. So until next week, for Holly Baird, I'm Joy Baird, and we will see you in the garden. <laughs>